Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody. I don't think too many people are listening. I said good morning, everybody. That's better. That's better. Glad to see everybody this morning. It's a beautiful day. Brother Dave Bear was talking about this morning. When, as soon as I came in, he said, well, it's a beautiful day outside. I have to agree with that 100%. It's a beautiful day. It is a day the Lord has made. They're all beautiful, aren't they? The rain is beautiful. And even you know the snow is beautiful. We just don't like to see it on too long. It seems to stay on too long in the, in the wintertime. But it's beautiful. It's a beautiful world that God's made. And uh, uh, we, do, we do mess it up. Man does mess it up sometimes. But like I said, it's good to see everybody this morning. We're, we're glad to have you all here that decided to come out here, make it their will to come out, and was able to. Thank God for the, for the amount of strength and, uh, uh, that he gives us to be able to, to come around. He does control our movement and our being. We need to thank him for the things that he does for us. You got a song there, Dale Ember? Yeah, let's do number uh, 140, Love Lifting Me. 140. 140. <laughs> sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me now say
For those on the video, we are New Macedonia Baptist Church in Newburgh, Kentucky. I'm Pastor Randall Baker. Thank you for joining us. And I hope God will give you a blessing today. If we, if we come to church expecting a blessing, we can get one. Yep. We come not, then we don't. You get out what you put in. That's exactly what I think Pat used to say. If you come expecting a blessing, don't bring a thimble. Yep. Bring you a big old uh, tub or a big old, uh, what he said, basket. The old bushel basket. You don't send many bushel baskets anymore, do you? <laughs> and also, I used to say, if you if you uh, if you go uh, praying for rain, take an umbrella with you. Show a little faith, a little confidence, because God's faithful. God's true. You know, we 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 are not as faithful as we should be sometimes. We, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna mention something before we take up, uh, but before we even go to prayer, I just want to mention before. Uh, before I forget it, while it's fresh in my mind, that they will be starting on the parking lot today after church. They're going to be cleaning it out today, and they're going to be uh, what, getting the weeds out, getting the dirt out of the cracks so they can fill them up. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have the, the uh, uh, parking lot resurfaced, not repaved, but we're going to have it resurfaced. It's not just going to be uh, the oil dumped on it. It's going to be a, a, a thick, tar, uh, rubbery kind of a surface. Uh, so they're going to resurface it, and they're going to paint, uh, repaint the lines and the uh, uh, wheelchair uh, things on there. The, uh, the handicap markings. Handicap markings. Thank you. So uh, what we'd like to do when we do get to where we're taking up the offering, uh, we're going to we're going to also take up an offering for that if you want to give to the. How much will it be? Twenty one hundred dollars. Twenty one seventy five. Twenty one seventy five. And that'll, and that'll be cleaning up, and that'll be uh, resurfacing, repainting, re everything. That'll be doing it all, $2,175. Uh, so if you want to donate toward that, what we'll do here probably is after we take up the money, at the end of the service, I think I'll probably have Jeremy wait in the back if he would, and you can give a donation then. But just keep that in mind that we will be donating for that. If we don't get enough to uh, do it, then we'll take it out of the building fund. But we have to have it done. The parking lot's getting in bad shape. It's getting worn down, it's getting cracks in it, and, and uh, 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 leaves and, and weed growing up in it. We don't wanna to have to start mowing the parking lot. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have that done. It's, it's something, we, we've been trying here on Tuesdays, coming in, a group of men and women have been coming in, trying to, to clean paint and, and fix up things that have been uh, going bad on us for a long time. I think uh, progress is being made, if you notice around, you can see, especially on the outside, a lot of cleaning and a lot of uh, uh, painting have been done, and inside, ladies have done the, clean the pews and everything, and a lot of things they have done. What's that? I think clean the curtains, uh, the window blinds, the cabinet, the uh, uh, carpet, uh, many things. Yeah, the carpets have been recently cleaned. Yeah, I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, we had the carpets. We had a, a cleaner come in and clean the carpets, the ladies, the ladies did, and uh, uh -huh. I think they did a really good job with it. Yep. Uh, we had some big stains on it. We need to remember this, folks, not to, not to bring food and drinks that will stain up here, if you, can, if you can remember not to do that. Because it does, once it falls on the carpet, it makes a big black spot. Whatever color it is, you know, it attracts the dirt and makes a big black spot on But thank you for, for not uh, eating and drinking up here. <clears throat> water's okay, of course. Not because I have water up here, but water won't do, <laughs> water won't do anything to it. But uh, thank you, thank you for, for abiding by that. <clears throat> you as I say not, how does that do right? I can't hear you, buddy. You as I say not as I do. Yeah, I do as I say not as I do, that's right. <clears throat> Well, so we're going to go ahead and take up some prayer requests. Uh, Brother Stanley, the brewer, called me last night and said he wouldn't be here today, <clears throat> pardon me, because uh, he still has a lot of trouble with his back and his legs, and he does have to see another doctor uh, next week sometime. Now, I also said she won't be here next week, but don't worry about her. She's not sick. <laughs> I just want to say this because next week when we see her out of the pew and I say, uh, well, Elsie must be sick. She ain't here. You can say, no, she said she wasn't going to be here. She's got a previous engagement. So she won't be able to be here. But we can ask a blessing on her while she's gone with whatever she's doing. But we are going to go ahead and take up some prayer requests. Yeah. Um, pray for our Cameron. He's having surgery done Tuesday. Uh, our grandson Cameron has hurt his ankle. and He's going to have some surgery on Tuesday. He's got some broken bones and uh, cartilage and, and ligaments torn. Yeah. Uh, our grandson Preston's got something broke out on him and he's itching all over. That ain't fun when you itch all over. Yes, ma'am. 
I just remember Charles. She still looks Paul, bad to me. Paul Deaton's uh, wife. She's going to beat me, so everybody just pray extra hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. it, yes, ma'am. I want to pray for my family and Sue Sebastian. Sue? She's in very bad shape. Okay. Keep praying your prayers too, then. Anybody? Keep, keep uh, Geneva in your prayers as well. And William says keep him in your prayers. Yes, ma'am. Me and my family, especially two of my siblings. Okay. Pam? My mother, um, I said this morning when he asked for prayer that she's going blind and she's going to have some surgery to try to help her be able to see some things okay. in her back and her leg. All right. Keep Millie in your prayers. She's having a lot of issues. Yeah, Dexter? Uh, got a huge prayer list and also I say this often but it's so important to me that lost and undone needs our prayers. Yep, they sure do. <coughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Rochelle. Let's keep praying for my Aunt Tina. Um, she's still in the hospital so she's fine. Okay, you pray for her then. May? Anybody else? Larry? Remember Micah and remember Madison. Go through some text, please. All right. Remember them. Prayer request. Yeah. Uh, remember all those families who lost their loved ones, the little children, and that shooting. Yeah. Don't remember them. Anybody else? Rainer, just remember all of them from Vietnam. I know my other grandbabies got out of school this week for their summer breaks, you know, so just remember all those little kids uh, be extra careful this summer. Watch out after them. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people just graduated this yeah, year. They and they're, uh, you know, they're having, to start, they're having to go out into the world now, aren't they? And some of them, you know, uh, uh, my, well, my granddaughter go to a Christian school, so she's going to have to go out into the secular world and try to get a job or at least go to college somewhere. And, uh, it's rough, man. Yes, it is. Well, it's rough for, for kids nowadays, I think. It all, always was, but I think they've even got a tougher time up than we had probably. You know, keep the children in your prayers. Yeah, buddy? Yeah, I'll pray for Brooklyn. Uh, she's going into the real world, and... Uh, That's rough. You know, she's going to be a teacher, and what's going on in classes today is not a good thing. If you teach at a secular school, it's certainly... You, your, your hands are tied in a lot of, yeah. a lot of things. They are. Yeah, keep Brooklyn in your prayers. Anybody else? Am I missing anybody? Yes, sir, Mitchell? Those families down there lost all those kids down there in Texas. Yeah, I think somebody mentioned that Pam did, but yeah, that's, that's exactly right. There's actually one in Buffalo and then one in Texas. And uh, also, what about the, that lady beside you? Is she had needed some prayers? Yeah, she's still pretty bad off. She's been having some issues, and she told me she fell, you fell out the front door or something, or the kitchen door or something. That, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we think that's funny, but actually, you fall and get hurt, it ain't too funny. No, it ain't. It ain't too funny. No, it ain't. Yeah. Keep a man in prayer. She's been having a couple of issues lately and uh, needing your prayer. And Mitchell himself, he's got a little bit of heart trouble here and there. You know, that's that's funny to say a little bit of heart trouble, because that's a big issue. That's a big thing. That can be. That is. That can be a big thing. Am I missing anybody? Where's my friend Sandy? William's friend Sandy. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody got a silent request on their heart? God does know your heart. He knows what we stand in need of even before we ask, but we still do need to ask Him. Let's go ahead and whoever will, uh, any man that will uh, come on up and we'll go up and we'll go around the altar here and we'll pray to God and uh, and we will ask uh, Brother Slay if he would uh, pray for us and we'll all agree with him in prayer. Let's do that. Freedom to be able to come to your house, Lord, to worship you. 
present for it. And Lord, we just ask that you would just bless Brother Randall when he comes to the stand, that he bring a message to feed the flock. And we ask it all in the name of your Son, Lord, and Savior Jesus Christ. And amen. 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 If you're able to, go ahead and stand up and we will uh, take up the offering. I guess uh, today we will have uh, Jeremy and, uh, and Slay pick, take it up. Is Jeremy going to sing with you? So they can keep us right No, he's going to take up the offering. Okay. Instead of walking all the way back. <laughs> yeah, that's good. If you're able to, stand up. If you're not, you can remain seated. Let's do 366. Sing Three. the wondrous story. 366. Sir, that's a wondrous story, guys, when you think about it. Nothing like it. It's the greatest, greatest story ever told, wasn't it? That's it. That's exactly right. And this was true. That's right. And you can bank on that. So. Yeah, when we say story, sometimes we mean something made up. Yeah, this isn't made up. This is true. So, 366. That's right, 366. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Singing with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Singing with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. I was bruised, but Jesus healed me. Faint was I from many a fall. Sight was gone, and fears possessed me, but he freed me from them. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. Days of darkness still come o'er me, sorrows past.
If you want to, if you do want to send in uh, your offering or whatever you want to send in for the church, running the church, for the building fund, for the parking lot uh, project here, for the ladies club, the Sunday school, whatever you want to send it in, send it in to P.O. Box 151, Alexandria, Kentucky, 41001. And as always, thank you for what you've given. Thank you for what you will give, and may the Lord richly bless you for it. Today's offering was $309, and may God bless you for that as well. And we were talking about in Sunday school this morning, uh, you know, we ask for donations, but we only ask for them if you are uh, willing and cheerfully giving it. We don't want you to be grudgingly giving. We don't want you to feel like you have to give anything because it's, there's not an admission fee here. There's not, uh, you know, we don't have to, you don't have to pay to come here. We're glad to have you if you're able to pay or if you're not able to, to help with the projects that we need done or running of the church. If you're not able to, you're just as welcome here as a person that gave us what he can give. You know, we, we appreciate that. We appreciate you and not your money. But we thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us. And this is, as, as, as everybody that's ever been a pastor here in the church, I've always said, New Macedonia, people are, they are generous people. And, you know, we're glad, glad to have them. Glad, we're glad to have you people, our, our good Christian family. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do for us. Who's got a song then? Sir, you still want to sing that or you not? All right. Hell, you and Jeremy ever get your song together? You were going to sing, or you never did? No, we didn't. Okay. We, we sure did. It's a conflict of schedules, I guess. A lot okay, of that's fine. I got one. All right, well, come on up and do it then. <laughs> This is called Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. It's a song that Truman uh, really liked. He said he remembered, I think, as a young man or as a child, somebody used to sing it, I think. He said his grandfather or somebody. <coughs> so, uh, I don't do the greatest, but I try to sing it as best I can. It's, it's in the office there. <laughs> That song doesn't have any ringing bells in it or anything. That, that wasn't a thing I created. <laughs> Time is filled with sweet contrition. Not of earth on move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to His hand, God's unchanging hand. Hold to His hand, God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Trust in Him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring, if by earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to Him cling. Hold to His hand, God's unchanging hand. Hold to His hand, God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, fair and bright the home in glory, your enraptured soul will view. Hold to His hand, God's unchanging hand. Hold to His hand, God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand.
Well, I'm glad, glad that God is unchanging. Amen. Glad that He uh, made promises to us and He sticks to His promises. You got one, Dale, you want to sing? Uh, no, that's fine. Anybody else got one they want to sing? William? Uh, I think I'll pass you there. You did say a while back you were going to sing one in a couple of weeks. Well, I was going to sing that Sunday and I didn't get asked, though. So. Well, now, now, wait, I don't, I don't buy that. I don't think you should have. I don't buy that. Okay, you ain't going to sing. That's fine. Go ahead and uh, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. You know, for many years there have been... Uh, people claiming to have made a deal with the devil. Made a deal with the devil and uh, the devil that supposedly gets their soul and they in return can get fame, fortune, or maybe uh, immortality. And, you know, we see it in all kinds of things. They got plays about it, movies, songs, and, and even tales from, from the dark ages even uh, uh, where the people made bargains with the devil, supposedly. And, and you know, let's still hear about it today. You know, I'm sure we've all heard about that. You still hear about... Uh, rock stars and movie stars and stuff making deals with the devil to be able to get famous and uh, but you know what that's all fairy tale and I'll tell you why that's a fairy tale and I'm saying the devil's not a fairy tale because the devil is a very real character he's a very real uh, person entity whatever he is but the devil is a deceiver the Bible tells us that he's a deceiver he's a liar and he's a murderer now, he may deceive people into thinking he can make them famous, and he might be able to make people famous. I don't know that. But here's the thing about it. He ain't got no power over your soul. He has zero power over your soul, and he can't give you immortality. That's not within his realm. That's not within his, his power to do that. There's not any place in the Bible, in the Holy Word of God, that we can read where the devil can send anybody or can take anybody to hell. We never, we never do read that. We can't see it anywhere. That's only God who's the righteous judge. He is the only one that can do that. God's the only one that can do that to anyone. It, uh, this is not what I told you to turn to, but in Matthew 25, 41, Jesus speaking says this, Then shall he say unto those, them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. <coughs> The devil and his angel, angels, the demons or the devils is with him, they will suffer the same fate as the condemned, as the damned here will suffer. They'll suffer the same thing at the end times. They will. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for all the good, great, and perfect gifts that you've given us, Lord. We just ask you to bless this message today. Let it go out to someone's heart, Lord, someone that is confused about salvation, someone that's confused about who their Savior is, Lord. Just ask you to bless them with this message. Heal them if be your will, Lord, and let them come to you with a contrite spirit and a broken heart, dear God, showing that they are indeed ready to be saved, Lord. We thank you for it. We'll ask you to bless this sermon, as I said, Lord, and be with us in all things. We'll give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. So in Revelation 2.10, it says this. Jesus speaking again said, Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried. And he shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now Satan, the devil, has some power on this earth. I mean, we, we've talked about that before. We can read that in the Bible. He's the God of this, of this earth, the Bible says. He can tempt you. He can persecute you. He can even put you in prison, like we have said earlier. He, he can give you sicknesses. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how much power over death that he has because Jesus Christ, he, he won that victory over death. But he cannot send you to hell. It's very plain. The devil cannot send you to hell. That's not what he can do. Uh, he doesn't have that power. He can only do what God allows him to do. That's all that the devil has the power to do, just what God can do. Now, does that stop him from trying? Never has it, never will. He's going to try. He's going to try to do whatever he can do. But, but hear this, if you have made a deal with the devil, I hope that none of you have done that, but if you have made a deal with the devil, you can break that contract. It's easy to break. It's an easy thing to break. It's just, it's just believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins that he rose on the third appointed day. And then the Bible just tells you to call on his name. The Bible says, then, if you do those things, thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say if you've made a deal with the devil, you can't be saved. It just says if you do those things, thou shalt be saved. 
Now, the devil's name uh, means some different things. It means adversary, and that means enemy. He means an enemy. But it also means this. It means accuser. The devil's name means he's the accuser. Even if you're a child of God, of, of the devil, or if you're a child of God, but if you're, even if you're a child of the devil, even if you've given your life over to him, and, and that is, if you haven't made your uh, election and your calling, sure, you are a child of the devil. Well, the Bible makes that pretty clear. And I'll tell you this, even if you're a child, he has, he has no loyalty to you. He doesn't love you. He doesn't care for you. Like Jesus says, catch your cares on him for he cares for you. Jesus does. The devil doesn't. The devil is pure evil. He's wicked. And he only wants your destruction in any way that he can get it. But only you can, can, can determine where you go. And that's by accepting or believing in Jesus Christ or not believing him. The devil even tried to make a deal with Jesus Christ. Matthew 4, 1. Matthew 4, 1 is where I told you to turn to. It says this. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was, in a, he was hunger, afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in his hands they shall bear thee up, that at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. You know, that is Bible. That is in the Bible. The devil was quoting Bible to, to Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says this, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now here's where the devil tries to make a deal then. He says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Amen. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Let's turn on over to Matthew uh, 26, 14. Matthew 26, 14, just a few pages over in your Bible. The use of the word devil as a name for Satan is only used in the New Testament. Now, the word devils, devils, is, uh, is in the Bible four times uh, uh, for the Old Testament uses. In all four cases, it's not referring to Satan, but rather, well, in a sense it is, but it's referring to idols, to worshiping idols. In Leviticus 17, 7, it says, And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone before. All four times it's used, it's used in that same manner, that they have offered sacrifices unto idols. The word for devil... And the Hebrew word is saw here. And it can mean devil or it can also mean goat. Does that mean anything to anybody? Because when the Satanists have their rituals, they wear goat heads and goat masks. That's the reason. That's where they get that at. And that's, and that's why they do that. Now the Greek word that's used in the New Testament for it is uh, diabolos, which I'm sure many have heard. And that means Satan. It can mean uh, a false accuser. It can mean devil, and it can mean slanderer, and that's exactly what Satan is. There are some, there are some people that choose Satan over, over God. Quite a few more, more people will choose Satan and will die and go to hell than they will go to heaven. But you know what? There's people that choose Satan. They're probably already evil. Most of them already are. They're already more interested in possessions and more what they can get out of things while they're alive here on this earth than they are for eternal uh, glory in heaven, for eternal life in heaven. Uh, the most well-known case of anybody making a deal with the devil is one of Jesus' own disciples. We know that Jesus wasn't fooled by him. He wasn't fooled by him. He knew who he was. Jesus said in John 6, 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. Jesus knew that the betrayer, he knew the one that would betray him would be Jesus Iscariot, son of Simon. He knew that all along. He wasn't fooled. God is not mocked. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. God, you, don't, you can't fool God with anything. You might say, you know, someone might say, well, 
Judas didn't make a, a deal with the devil. He made a deal with the chief priest for 30 pieces of silver. Here's what Jesus said about the unbelieving Jews in John 8, 44. He said, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. In Revelation 2, 9, he said this, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So those unbelieving Jews, the unbelieving Jews, I'm not saying all Jews, I'm just saying the unbelieving Jews were devils. They were devils. In Matthew 26, uh, 14, it says this, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they coveted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought an opportunity to betray him. <clears throat> Go over and turn over to Job. Job chapter 1 verse 6. Job chapter 1 verse 6. Uh, Mark David Chapman, many of you may know who he was. He was the man that shot the, the beetle, uh, John Lennon. He killed him out in front of his apartment building in the Dakota. And, and he said in an interview that he prayed to Satan to give him the strength to be able to shoot and kill uh, John Lennon. And he said that when he, came, when he actually pulled the gun out and do it, he said a voice in his head was saying, do it, do it, do it, over and over and over again. He said a voice within his head was doing that. Now, it doesn't actually say that he made a deal with the devil, but he certainly asked the devil to help him to do that. The Bible warns you about making deals with the devil. It warns you, or more precisely, about missing out on salvation. You're making a deal with the devil if you don't. Jesus asked uh, this in Mark 8, uh, 36 and 37. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for its soul? Now, you know, if that's true, I was saying people make a deal with the devil. It seems like people would give fame and fortune and wealth up for their souls if they were able to do that. But just as Satan had tried to make a deal with Jesus, he also uh, tried to challenge God in a, in a kind of a duel or, or make a deal with him, saying that one of his most loyal subjects, one of, the, one of the people that loved God, most only loved and served God, he said he only loves and serves you because you've got a hedge built around him, because you've got that protective hand on him. He said, he said he would curse, he said, Job will curse you to your face if you remove your hand from him. If you remove that protective hand from him, he will. But you know, uh, Satan had to keep changing his side of the bargain. Here in Job chapter 1, verse 6, it says this, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered, the Lord said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for not? Has not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Hast thou blessed the works of his hand and his substance in the, is the increase in the land? Uh, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, that he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself but not for thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of, of the Lord. Now Satan did these things to Job. And of course he did bad things to Job. But Job didn't, Job didn't curse God. He did not curse God. So uh, Satan had to change his, his plan, his part of it. He said, skin for skin, all that a man had he'll give for his own life. He said, take, touch his life. Touch his very health and see what happens. He'll curse you to your face. And of course, what did Satan do? Jesus, uh, God said, you can, you, can, you, can, uh, you can touch him, but do not take his life. Do anything but take his life. So Satan went, did the worst thing he could think of. He put boils from the top of Job's head to the soles of his feet so that Job, Job had no time, night or day, no rest at all. But you know, Job still didn't curse God. So you know what? Satan ended up losing again. I like to see Satan lose things. I, I like to see in the Bible when Satan loses. I like that. Turn over to Judges. Turn your uh, Bibles over to Judges chapter 11, verse 30. 
uh, judges at 1130. You know what? There's people who make deals with the devil, but have you ever heard of anybody making a deal with God? People talk about making deals with God. I think that's probably a lot more common. And people will, people will say this, God, if you'll let me live or you let my child live or you'll heal me of this or do this for me, that I'll, that I'll, you know, I'll be good. You know, I'll be real good. I'll come to church every Sunday. I'll, I'll do tithing. I'll do service. I'll do whatever I can for God. People say that stuff. They promise God all kinds of things. And you know, if God does end up blessing them and healing them or, or, or whoever it is, is they want it done for, they a lot of times won't end up there. They won't hold up their end of the bargain. Their end of the deal will fall down. In Deuteronomy 23, 21, it says this, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. Now, I don't ever read in the Bible where God wants you to make a deal with him. He'll never tell us to make deals with him. You know, his mercy is endless, and his mercy doesn't have, a, it's not a one-sided thing. Uh, but if you do make a deal with God, you better keep it. You better keep it if you make a deal with him. You better. You know, but we don't have a bargaining chip in that, in that uh, fight there. We can't, God don't have anything we need. What's, what? I mean, we don't, have any, we don't have anything that God needs. God has plenty that we need. We don't have anything that God needs. God can make it just fine without us. We can't, we can't do nothing without Him. It says that in John 5, 15. Without Him, we can do nothing. But then the Bible does also say that we can do all things through God who strengthens me. We know that. We need him. We need his mercy. And I, you know, I've given my testimony before, and I've talked about it before, how that I had cancer with little chance of surviving it, little chance of, of recovery. But the doctor said that if, that if it did go into remission, he even told me that at that time, if it goes into remission, if we can give you all this chemo and it goes into remission, then in two or three years it's going to come back again, and there won't be anything we can do for you at that. Uh, so, you know, I was, I was pretty uh, resigned to the fact that I, that I was going to, uh, be dead within a couple of years. Now, when that happened, I didn't try to make a deal with God. I didn't. But you know what? I decided within myself, I didn't make a deal with God, but I decided within myself, if, if God lets me live, then I will, uh, then I will try to serve him more. I, I didn't say, God, if you'll, if you will let me live, I'll do that. I just said, if he decides to let me live, if God decides to let me live, I'll try to do that. I didn't make a deal with him, like I said. It's been 15 and a half years. And though I, you know, I'm definitely not perfect or even good for that matter, I have made an attempt to do a better job at serving God. I fail, as everybody does. I still fail. Amen. But as I said, I didn't try to make a deal with God. And if God decides to remove me here, you know, within, within tomorrow, that'll be okay. Because you know what? The Bible says, as, Job, as with Job, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. But then it finishes up with this, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, there was a man in the Bible that made a deal. He made a bad deal. He made a deal with God. It was a man named Jeph Jephthah. And Jephthah, and Jephthah was uh, the commander of the Israeli army. And he was going to fight the Ammonites. And the Ammonites were bitter enemies with Israel. God hated the Ammonites for what they had done to Israel when they were in the wilderness. They had snuck up behind them and picked off the, the slower and weaker ones in the back. And God hated them for that. So, so Jephthah, when he went in, they were still pretty powerful this time. When Jephthah, when he was going ready to go in to fight them, he made a vow or a deal with God. In Judges 11.30, Judges 11.30 says this, And Jephthah vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me. When I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he smote them from Eor, uh, even till thou come to Benoth, even twenty cities, and under the plain of the vineyards, with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah and to his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dancing. 
and she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Bad deal. He made a bad, bad deal. Go over, turn your Bibles over to John 4, 7. Uh, rather, James 4, 7. James 4, 7. James 4, 7. Now, that was a foolish deal that he made. That was a foolish vow that he made. God obviously didn't respect it. It was reckless. It was selfish. He knew that somebody or something in his household was going to have to die because of that vow. He knew that. He knew that. And uh, as the leader of his household, he should have been there to protect the people in his household. But instead, he put them in danger. He put them out to, to be a sacrifice. You know, what's, what's really bad about that is God doesn't accept human sacrifice. God doesn't want it. He doesn't condone it. He destroyed the people of Canaan because of their human sacrifice. Uh, so Jephthah, he could have offered himself. He could have said, if, if we do this, if we get through this, and we give us victory, Lord, then just take me. But he didn't do that, did he? He said, whoever comes out of my house. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring that he probably figured one of his servants would come out to meet him when he came. I figured he would think that. He said, I can, I can probably do you. I can probably do without one of my servants. But his daughter came out, his only daughter, the daughter that he loved. And he, and he says here, the funny thing that he says that you're the one of the ones that trouble me. He was the troublemaker, wasn't he? He was one that caused the problem. Uh, at any rate, it didn't turn out the way he wanted it to turn out. Now, I talked a few minutes ago about making deals with God, and we were just talking about that. Now, and I talked about earlier about making deals with the devil. Well, that was actually what my sermon was based on, was making deals with the devil. But God tells us in the Holy Scriptures how not to make deals with the devil, but rather how to deal with the devil. How you can deal with the devil, more specifically how to avoid the snares of the devil. Now, if you're not prepared, and I'm sure most of you have seen that, if you haven't, you will as you, as, you, as you go on through life a little bit more. But if you're not prepared, a slick-talking salesperson can talk you into something, into something that you haven't, that you didn't even want, that you didn't want. He can talk you into buying things you don't need, things that you don't want. Now, in cartoons and shows and stuff, you can see a door, door salesman, and you'll be talking to a customer outside their house, and the customer's trying to get away, trying to shut the door, and they got their foot stuck inside the door. So you say, if I just get my foot in the door, a lot of salesmen say, I can make the sale. But you know, the person's trying to close the door, and they got their foot stuck in there. But uh, the devil is like that, folks. He's like that. And he, he will, uh, he'll, he's subtle, the Bible says he's so, but once, once he has you hooked a little bit, then he's going to put on full force. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna be like a pushy salesman. But here's the best defense, is not to let him have that first inch, not to let him have it at all, because, uh, 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 what is it you say, William, if you give him an inch, you'll make him a ruler. You know, that's, that's exactly what, what it is. The old saying, of course, if, is if you give him an inch, you'll take a mile. And there's a saying, of course, that an ounce of, uh, of prevention is worth a, worth a pound of cure. So the Bible puts it this way, though, in Ephesians 4, 27, Neither give place to the devil. Don't let him in your life at all. Don't let him, don't carry me anything. The devil's always looking for this. He wants a way to get into your family. He wants a way to get into you. He wants to get a, a way to get into your marriage. He wants to get away in, into your children's lives. He wants to get into schools. And I tell you this, people, he wants to get into the church. Uh, I heard a while back somebody said that uh, the devil gave up trying to just uh, uh, wreck the church. And he joined it. You know, that happens. He does it. He wants to get in there and he wants to do whatever he can. He knows he can't take your salvation. He knows that he won't be able to take your salvation, but he will be able to take the joy of your salvation. David didn't, didn't pray for his salvation to be returned, but that would, God would return the joy of his salvation. You know what else he can destroy? Satan can destroy your testimony. He can do that. You know, if, if, you have a, if, you, if you don't have a testimony, you can't testify to anybody. You cannot testify to someone about Jesus. What if you're on the street and, and, a, and a drunk guy on the street there staggers up to you and he wants to say, let me tell you about Jesus and how he can save your soul and how he can do wonderful things for you. And that man might be saved. 
He may be saved. He may be on his way to heaven. But by his obvious sin there, he's, he's destroying his testimony. He's not being able, he's, not, he's lost his credibility and he's not going to be able to be taken seriously. Most people would just laugh at him probably. You know, what we like to do as people, we like to say, I'm better than that guy. I'm better than him. You know, I'm better than that person. I can do that better. I'm better than the drunk on the street. Are we any better than the drunk on the street? Not one bit, are we? Anybody that's saved here is only saved by the mercy of God. And you know what? We're still going to sin. Whether our sin's are obvious to anybody or whether it's not, we're still going to sin. But you know what? God says that if we do confess our sins to Him, He is right. He is righteous and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now why would he say that if we didn't need that done? We, did, we need it done all the time. Peter tells us this in uh, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. He's not talking about the sober like the drunk guy. Just be somber. Be, uh, you know, be serious. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So that's one of the ways God tells you how to deal with the devil. Be sober. Be vigilant. He's your adversary. James tells us in James 4, 7, and 8, James 4, 7, and 8, it says this, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you devil-minded. You devil 9 actually says this, Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaven, heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. So He's telling us some ways that we can uh, uh, deal with the devil, so that we can get the devil away from us. Resist the devil, He said. Resist the devil. Turn over in your Bibles to our uh, closing uh, verse in uh, Romans chapter ten. Romans chapter ten, verse nine. Don't make deals with the devil. Don't make deals with the devil. He's a deceiver. In the end, in the very end, in the end of life, he can't offer you anything but death and destruction. He himself will be cast into the lake of fire that burneth forever. If you have made a deal with the devil, if you have made a deal with the devil, just break it. Just break it. You can back out of it at any time, at any time, because all you have to do is put your faith, trust, and belief in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's the gospel. That's what saves you, the belief in that. And it says that you shall be saved. The Bible says that. Now, you may have think, you may think this. And I've committed, I've committed what you might consider to be unforgivable sins. You know, people might think that. I'm sure lots of people think that. Uh, but as we talked about this morning, we were talking about this. The Bible talks about some things that will be outside. Uh, sorcerers and, and whoremongers and adulterers. But he also says this. People that will be outside there, uh, and that's talking about those that have not made their election and calling sure. People outside there is one that maketh and loveth a lie. Just one lie. Just one lie. And as I asked this morning, who in here has not told a lie in their lifetime? I can't, I, I mean, I know some great people in my life, but I don't think I've known anybody that's never told one single lie. But just that one lie, just that one sin there will send you to hell for eternity if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Moses committed murder. The Bible says that he committed murder. He killed a man. He murdered a man. David committed adultery and then to cover it up, committed murder. You know, God didn't reject them. God used them both in mighty, mighty ways. He can use you too. He can also do that. All you have to do, all you got to do is this. All you got to do is look at what Romans... You guys come on up, Dexter and uh, Dale. Come on up. And whoever else wants to come up with them. But come on up. All you have to do is this. What Romans 10, 9 and 10 say. And then 13. It says this. Romans 10, 9 says this. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It says this in 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How about that? Shall be saved. You know what? If you're going to make a deal, make it with God like that. With just your part of it only be a belief. And what He's already done for you. He don't want you to work for what, you, what He's 
can give you because he just said it's just by belief. By belief in what he's done that they'll save you. That's what saves you, just the belief in his death, burial, and resurrection. And as I said earlier, and I, and I mean this sincerely, if you've made a deal with the devil, right. don't think you're condemned because of it. He cannot condemn you. The devil cannot condemn you. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, what's the Bible say? You're condemned already. You're condemned already. All you got to do is just believe. Just reverse that by believing in Jesus Christ. Ask Him to save you. The time you believe Jesus is Lord, the time you believe He died for you on the, on the cross, and then He rose again on the third appointed day. That's the gospel. He said that's all you have to believe. Just ask Him to save you. And He is faithful and He's just. He'll save you. He'll cleanse those sins from you and He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. As we sing, if God has spoken to you, go ahead and stand up if you're able to. If you're not, you can remain seated. Go stand up if you're able to. If God has spoken to you, come on up and we'll, we'll talk to you about how it is to be saved. We'll go more into it. And, and we'll show you exactly what the Bible says about being saved. Not a hard thing. Simple thing. Ain't you glad it's an easy thing? Absolutely. Let me ask you this, folks. Ain't you glad that God sent Jesus Christ down to die for your sins? Because, you know, if, 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 if he hadn't rose again, though, the Bible says, then our hope is it's just it's in vain. Our faith is in vain, but he did rise again. If you believe the Bible, you've got to believe that Jesus Christ came to earth as a man, that he died on the cross, and then he rose again on the third and pointed dead. And what did he do it for? For his own sake? No, for our sake. For our sake. Because we... We were lost in sin. He left great riches to come down for us. We were the one that needed him. We needed him to come down. And thank God that he did. Thank God he did come down for us. He made a way for us when there wasn't a way. As we sing. Just as I